Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We'll just um, wait until the hour and give everyone a few more minutes to join, but thanks for joining already. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We're just gonna wait one more minute. We have a few more people joining, but I see the numbers rising. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Great, welcome everybody. We are really pleased to have all of you with us today. I'm Kate, uh, Kate Richards, Outreach Manager for the Inclusive Data Charter, which is hosted by the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. The Inclusive Data Charter is an open and growing initiative and we support governments and organizations to become inclusive data champions taking action to ensure data systems don't leave anyone behind and exchanging knowledge on what does and doesn't work across our network. So the topic we're here to discuss today is very close to my heart and I look forward to really fascinating discussion. Thank you everyone for joining. So this webinar is the 22nd in a series hosted by the UN Statistics Division as part of the run up to the UN World Data Forum. The forum aims to foster cooperation an open dialogue among governments, civil society, academia, international agencies, and the private sector, with a big focus on how data can be used to accelerate progress on the SDGs. Before we dive into this interesting conversation, I wanted to note a few housekeeping points. Please remain on mute unless you're a designated speaker We'll use the chat function, which I see some of you already starting to, as a way to communicate during the webinar. We'll have time for questions after all the speakers present. We've already received a large number of very interesting questions through the registration form. They've helped shape the conversation today, and we've picked out a few that the panelists will address later. You can also send questions for the speakers um, to the host privately through the chat window, and we'll come to them in the second half of the webinar. Please feel free to have a discussion with the other participants in the window, in the chat window. And finally, I would really encourage you all to um, introduce yourself on the virtual um, chat room. You can find the chat function by looking for the icon that looks like a speech bubble. And just type in two words. Firstly, the, what, the country you're joining from, and secondly, the sector you represent, whether you're from an NSO, a private sector, an NGO. And I see some people are already starting to do that, so thank you for that. So our topic for today is innovations in measuring hard to count populations. 
the 2030 agenda emphasizes the inclusion of marginalized populations in its implementation. For this to be possible, we need evidence-based policies that are developed using data representative of all of society, including the hard to count populations for whom there's either a real or perceived barrier for representative inclusion in the data process. Hard count populations, such as those that are hard to locate, contact, interview, may not be captured in large scale data collection processes, such as censuses or surveys or administrative data sources. And while data impacts all of our lives, the considerations around ethics and risks are heightened when considering hard to count populations, especially as we deal with small sample sizes, um, population groups that are marginalized or choose to avoid official collection efforts. We know national statistical offices and organizations are using various strategies and methodologies for inclusion of these population groups. And there's a huge amount we can learn from each other and huge potential for strong and robust collaborations in this space. We have a really outstanding group of speakers here today. They have very extensive expertise on these topics and will share their experiences in using innovative methods to capture hard to count populations, as well as showcasing successful partnerships that make this possible. Before I turn it over to them, I'm keen to have a look at and see who's in the room. And I can see we have such a mix from many statistical offices through to civil societies. Uh, we have people from all the way from Canada across to India um, by way of Lithuania and uh, South Africa. So a really great and um, diverse group of people for this conversation. And we really encourage you to ask questions, to make observations in the chat and to be kind of involved in this. So to start us off, I'm going to turn over to Claudia Kappa, who's a senior advisor for statistics monitoring in the data and analytics section at UNICEF headquarters. She's the focal point for data collection and data analysis on early childhood development, child disability and child protection from violence, exploitation and abuse. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Kate. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be able to talk about this topic today. It's a topic that we have been um, we have been discussing for a while, of course, but there is still a lot that needs to be done. Uh, but in my in my presentation, I will talk specifically about the situation of street children and the challenges uh, that lie in measuring. Uh, the, the number of children in this in this situation. And the challenges are of different nature. So in my speak, in my presentation, I will talk about the ethical and methodological challenges. But of course, there are other challenges as well in terms of limited resources and investment, but also stigma and a little bit of resistance in, in really uh, incorporating uh, systematic data collection on this vulnerable population. So let me start in the next slide by giving you uh, a little bit of an overview of some of the definitional and conceptual issues uh, related to uh, street children. Because we are talking about a universe of children that have different type of relationship and connection with the street. And because of the complex nature of this relationship, the type of methodologies that we need to use to be able to systematically collect information on this population can be very different. And this is one of the reasons why, for instance, data collection has been lacking is also because there are still a, a, a number of different conceptual, definitional and methodological issues that need to be addressed. So let me start by using as a reference the United Nations um, uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child General Comment 21 that really set the standards for understanding priorities uh, uh, related to this population. There is a specific request and call to collect data, but in a way that doesn't stigmatize this population of children. Now, what do we mean by street children? Let's use the terminology that is embedded in these general comments that makes reference to street uh, associated children or children with a street association, which include children who depend on the street to live or to work 
alone, with peers, or with families. So, as you can see, this is a large definition, include a broader population of children who have some sort of connection with this, this public space of the street and for which the street plays a vital role. But this is not a definition that statisticians can easily work with. And when I see as a data person, when I see a definition like this, for me, it's already running, like I already get a headache. Why? Because from the measurement standpoint, we are talking about possibly children who are actually living in households and therefore could potentially be captured within the context of a household survey, which represents a very important source of data for many countries. But there are also children in this larger definition that might not be household based. And these are particularly hard to reach type of population in terms of data collection, because then we need to think about other type of, of data collection methods and source to be able to capture this definition. So UNICEF back in 2001 has tried to, in a way, separate these two groups and talk about children on the street, who are children who uh, spend significant time of their day in the street, but they return home at night. So these are a household based population who are also on the street. But uh, this is different from children of the street who, who are homeless homeless children, children who, who really have the street as the main venue where they live, sleep and work. And these are the ones that are really hard to reach because there is no way of, of really uh, collecting data on them unless we do a dedicated methods. Now, what complicates things is the fact that these population are fluid, meaning many children on the street becomes a time children of the street. So, so these two categories cannot be completely separated and they're not uh, they're not static but rather dynamic. So let's go now into the next sli slide. Because as I mentioned, for each one of these two categories, we can think about different approaches to gathering data. So when it comes to children, as I mentioned earlier, on the street, who goes back, who go back at home at night, they are likely to be captured by household survey. But we need to make sure that we include in this household survey a dedicated set of questions that allow us to identify and isolate these children vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the children who are in the households. And we are currently lacking tested and validated set of questions that can really help us understand whether there is this connection with the street and therefore isolate this population and, and understand how many they are and also what are their living conditions. So a lot of work still needs to be done to integrate in a household survey a core set of questions that will allow us to understand the characteristics of this population. And then when it comes to children off the street, as I mentioned earlier, these are missed by household surveys. They are hard to reach and count in part because of their interest to stay hidden and their mobile and transient lifestyle. They don't want to keep captured. They live very often in, in a sort of a informal, illegal settings. They are very mobile and transient. So it's very difficult for, for from the point of view of the sampling, for instance, to be able to identify this population, capture them, count them. And of course, a variety of methods have been developed. And over the years, uh, these methods were first developed, for instance, for certain other hard to reach population have been applied and tested to the population of street children. We conducted a review of studies. We came across 19 studies that have been conducted since 2000 on street children and have applied these methods, which include enumeration methods like points in time count or observational head count, capture recapture, for instance, methods, which is, is uh, aimed at to provide the population side estimation and can be also extended to cover the population of street children, but we can also rely on time location and responded driven sampling as a starting point to get a representative sample of this population and then use it also as the basis for population size estimation. Now, how do we decide about these methods? Well, it very much depends on the data needs we are trying to address because one data need can be enumeration and counting, which is different, of course, from a more in-depth assessment of the well-being of these children, because in this case, it's not just about counting them, 
but it's also about collecting information on their well-being, from, for instance, their nutritional status to their experience of violence and exploitation, etc. Now, regardless of these data needs and this matching of the data needs with the data sources, in the 19 studies we come across, we found a variety of tools and methods. So these projects were mostly um, handled by civil society organizations or researchers. We did not come across the systematic collection of data or any example of robust data collection led by a national statistical office. And we know how important it is to do this type of data collection, having the national statistical authorities leading this type of data collection. I wanted to conclude with a slide that really talk about what needs to be done and what type of partnership needs to be put in place. Because this is a collective responsibility. This is a very complex measurement uh, issue, and we need the, the expertise and resources from a number of partners. So if we can go to the next and last slide, I just wanted to show what roles and partnerships needs to be uh, put in place. First of all, of course, there is a lot that still needs to be done in terms of testing and validation of data collection instruments and methods. So this sporadic approach to data collection needs to be replaced by a concerted effort where the research institution uh, support through the testing and validation of robust methods and tools for data collection. And of course, governments have to uh, step up their games by really investing in the systematic collection of data on this population of children where, who have been left behind by many data collection efforts uh, for, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Civil society organizations play a very, very fundamental role here because they have enormous knowledge of actually the population of interest and they are best placed to help us refine the data needs, but also be able to capture this population of children. And finally, donors and international stakeholders have a responsibility. The investments in strengthening data collection for this population have been very, very limited. I mean, we have been actively trying to identify partners to invest in this type of data collection with very limited results, because this is no longer considered a priority as much as it was 20 years ago. And still the problem is very much, very much there. I'm gonna stop here. And I will be happy to address any question you might have. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Claudia. It's such a fascinating presentation and really interesting to hear the nuances in those definitions and your emphasis on partnerships and moving from sporadic to more concerted efforts. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you later on. We'll now pass over to Renice, who is a statistician um, at the government's peace and security section of the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. Renice handles statistics on human rights for vulnerable populations, especially persons with disability, forcibly displaced, women and girls, children, street families and the elderly. She is a strong champion for inclusive data and we're very pleased to have her with us today. Renice, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to share some of the data that we collect uh, in Kenya. And uh, we are also, I'm going to share about the collaboration that we had with uh, the National Commission for Human Rights that has really assisted us to collect more information on the forcibly displaced and stateless persons. Thank you. So, so far, Kenya has been a member of the EGRIS, and uh, we've been able to implement uh, a number of recommendations, especially on the refugees and asylum seekers, the stateless, and even uh, the internally displaced. And uh, one strategy that has worked for us as a country is the intersectional collaboration among stakeholders within the national statistical system. This is very important because you realize that as statisticians, you cannot know everything. We need the subject matter specialists to reach to the target population whenever we collect our data. So this is a very good strategy that has always worked for us. 
the main objective of having or using this approach is to respond to policy and data needs and also to build on the human rights based data principles where we have participation and we advocate for more disaggregated data. We also advocate for transparency and even accountability among other principles. So Kenya has implemented this through the technical working committees. We have over 10 technical working committees for various thematic areas, including one on governance, peace and security statistics, and even disability statistics. So we have members from various uh, ministries, even from uh, non-state actors, and uh, it has really worked for us. Another thing that uh, we have in plan is the action plan for the inclusive data data. Yeah, there we are really advocating for more disaggregation, especially for the ma marginalized groups where the refugees, asylum seekers, and the, the forcibly displaced persons fall. Then uh, as a national statistics office, we've also come up with a national strategy for development of statistics. This one is majorly meant to build the capacity of various stakeholders on statistical issues to ensure that they understand what is required and they also share with us what they expect us to do for them, especially to meet the needs of the vulnerable groups. Next slide. Now, we do collect various uh, types of data on this group of people. We have uh, the administrative data that we usually publish on an annual basis through the economic survey and statistical abstract. So there we capture some information and we get data from Refugee Affairs Secretariat. We have about uh, four uh, indicators or tables that we usually publish, and that is the number of refugee and asylum seekers by sex, age, where we capture children and adults, location, where are they located? We have got various camps, so we have the population by those camps, and then their country of origin. Then we've also managed to capture data on this special group uh, through census. The last census was conducted in 2019, and we have specific questions on ethnicity, nationality, uh, reasons for migration, among others, and this one's targeted majorly this special group. So what we realized is that the census results were lower than the data from the administrative source, so through the technical working committee, we are also addressing that. And if need be, we'll even conduct some surveys. Next slide. Now on the collaboration that we've had with the Human Rights Commission, we signed an MOU that is back in 2017, and it was a five-year uh, memorandum of understanding which will end in 2022, that is the next year, but uh, we've really assisted each other as institutions. That is uh, for the commission to understand some of the statistical issues that we really need them to address. And we've also got to understand the human rights issues that we must address when we are collecting or analyzing or reporting on various groups. Now, we have got some achievements since we had the Memorandum of Understanding, and uh, some of the achievements include uh, things like capacity building. That is the next slide, please. The next slide. Thank you. Now, we have got uh, various achievements that we've uh, made. Uh, the first one is uh, inclusion of the some questions in the census questionnaire, like the intersex this time around Kenya included that question, but it came through the collaboration between Human Rights Commission because as an institution, we didn't know that intersex was among the vulnerable groups that should be captured. We also had questions to capture stateless, even persons with disability, this time round, we included the Washington group short set of questions on disability, persons with albinism, 
and even the indigenous ethnic groups. So through that collaboration, we managed that. And uh, we also managed to incorporate the commission in the various technical working committees. For example, the Governance, Peace and Security Statistics Committee and even Disability Statistics Technical Working Committee. Through that, whenever we plan for surveys or any exercise, we do get their inputs and we believe we serve the needs of the people that uh, we are targeting. Then we've also held various capacity building workshops. That is KNBS initiated and even uh, uh, one initiated by the commission and we've learned a lot. Then uh, currently we are doing a pilot survey. We've done the cognitive test on the SDG 16 indicators uh, that, was, that is, has been organized by UNDP, OHCHR and UNODC, and we've managed to involve the commission. So uh, we'll continue with that. Then uh, the next slide. Out of that, we've set some uh, action plan for each of the institutions. And uh, as I had informed you, we have that strategy for development of statistics. We will make sure that uh, the commission is part of it. We'll also uh, en uh, ensure active information sharing between and within the national and uh, county level offices, the offices at the local or lowest level. We want to have that collaboration uh, taken down there so that at least they can also be part or feel part of that. Then we have continuous capacity building and uh, the proposal that we uh, have MOU implementation committees on various aspects because you know human rights aspects are wide and uh, we need to have thematic area committees so we have that plan and we also have a plan to have joint resource mobilization for more surveys, publications and even interventions. So okay, the commission should also provide uh, networks and linkages with the PSOs because you know as a, a statistical office we might not directly be uh, in contact with them but through the commission we know we can uh, get to them. Otherwise, uh, that is it. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Venise. Such a comprehensive and interesting presentation. And it's so brilliant to see the emphasis KMBS is putting on reaching these uh, different population groups, IDPs, refugees, and all the different dis, um, disaggregation dimensions you're focusing on too and um, the work you're doing with such diverse partners is very impressive. I'd like to bring in now Alison um, and Alison leads the research centre and heads up technology impact area for AARP. She's focused on helping the organisation, consumers and external stakeholders understand, engage with and innovate for the 50 plus consumer and their families. So, Alison, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, and so glad to be uh, following the last two speakers. I think there are a lot of really great insights here that I'm going to be building off of when I talk about older adults. For those of you who are not familiar with AARP, um, our goal is to empower older adults to live how they want as they age. And we do that through a range of ways. We work with um, governments at the state, federal, uh, local level. We also are working with industry to develop products and services for older adults and really um, aggregate the marketplace. And then we also work directly with consumers through our media and our education vehicles um, and, and particularly focused on you know, being able to help not only our 38 million members, but anybody who is over 50 plus and their families. So what I'm going to focus on today are some of the critical issues for older adults that we're seeing and some of the solutions that um, we're also seeing out there. All right, next slide, please. So let me start with talking a little bit about the, the measurement dilemma. And again, you're going to see some 
uh, commonalities, I think, start to, to show up as we uh, are going through the speakers. So one is that we have a real disconnect. We know that older adults actually have huge amounts of economic and social and societal impact, but there's also um, a lot of light measurement on them for a range of reasons. When we talk about older adults, we tend to talk about the 50 plus, but we know that the measurement issues happen more when we start talking about the 70 plus and even sort of the 80 plus consumers. So when I'm speaking today about them, I'm really going to be focused more on those 70 and 80 plus consumers. And there's a range of issues for that. Um, one may be physical address. So I know this came up in Claudia's talk um, about, you know, um, children in the streets, but you know, for older adults, it could be that they are in a, a nursing home or some kind of assisted living facility, and that can be problematic or in transition, um, you know, as well. And so that's an issue that we're seeing. You could also have issues of cognitive or accessibility um, issues. And so those are both things that as we age, we tend to see. And in fact, as we are having an even um, larger older adult set, which in particularly hyper aged countries is becoming even more of an issue, right? That, that there's an intersection between cognitive and physical disabilities um, like sight, for example, and age. And then we also have issues of technology access or comfort with technology, which I'm actually going to talk about in a second. So I'll sort of leave that one to the side. The other issue that we're seeing is often a need to include relevant secondary populations. And in particular here, um, caregivers are a really critical group that we often either need to get input from, particularly if we're dealing with issues of cognitive or accessibility access, um, or are needing to sort of get their perspective on issues and are often not included in um, either, you know, sort of considerations for research or sampling frames. Um, the next slide, please. So um, uh, go back. I think we skipped one. Thanks. Um, so I mentioned the issue of technology, and I think one of the things we're seeing in research more generally is this issue of um, not being able to access or, or address the digital divide is exacerbating accounting divide, particularly as a lot of different methodologies and research platforms are moving to online. And so we see that with older adults, and we talk about um, sort of around 70 or 75 is a tech cliff where we see we start to see more differences with older adults and other parts of the population with regard to um, access and comfort with online technology. And so one of the things that we're looking at is actually addressing issues of digital inclusion um, nationally and globally as also being able to deal with some of these issues around counting. And so that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure we brought up, but also the need, um, particularly again, as research methods have been moving more and more online to continue to do multimodal research for older adults. And so that's something that we're really focused on, making sure that you're continuing to do phone or mail or intercept or whatever those different modes are. And I will say that that's not the norm. Um, and I think that a lot of groups tend to be moving more towards online, um, but we feel like the multimodal is still really important. Next slide. Um, I think we're also looking at how can we solve some of these issues. And so um, we actually last week launched with uh, NORC out of the University of Chicago, which is one of the largest probability panel providers in the US. We launched a new um, opportunity for groups to use our panel, which is called Foresight 50 Plus. And so this is the first, it's US based. So we're again, we're just focused on the US right now for this particular product, but it's the first one that's a probability sample focused on older adults. And the idea here is can we create something? And this is a nonprofit partnership, NORC is nonprofit, and so is AARP, but can we create something that's actually sustainable in the marketplace that both makes the case for doing research with older adults, um, right? And having access to really high quality data, um, but also then provides the solution, right? So that's one of the issues is we're often as ARP talking, whether it's to government or marketplace and saying, you need to do this research, but without the resources there to do it, we think that's problematic. So we think we've stumbled upon a sustainable model for developing that, and we're excited about that being out there. The other idea um, is that we need to be thinking more about community partnerships, and we're in the process of looking at taking this model that we've used for Foresight and doing work in populations that have had issues around being harder to reach. In particular, right now, we're looking at Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations, and those needing to be real community efforts. That can't just be, you know, sort of a top-down effort. We really need to engage the community there. Final slide. 
And I think the, um, and we heard a little bit about this earlier with the sort of need to move from sporadic to ongoing. Um, I think that's one of the things that we're really looking at as well is how are we moving from um, sort of point in time surveys to broader indices or dashboards that can give a better sense of how we're moving on key outcomes. I see the other thing that we're dealing with from an age perspective is moving from this idea of just age-based work into the idea of life transitions, critical moments in time that consumers or populations have, um, whether it's a moment of displacement from their home or uh, becoming a caregiver, and that that actually is critical for us to capture and understanding what's going on and the dependent variables that come with that. So it's another consideration that we want to sort of add to the set. And with that, I'll, I'll thank you and turn it back over to Kate. Alison, that was really brilliant. Thank you for covering so many really important points. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions later on. But um, yeah, I think lots of the points around, you know, not taking that top down approach and thinking much more about how do we work with communities is a point that comes across every more marginalized group or a hard to reach group. We're going to move to our final speaker and then we'll uh, have a lot of time for questions and um, our answers from our speakers. So Sanjay is our final speaker. Sanjay is the chief curator at the Societal Platform. He's got more than 30 years of diverse global experience across corporate and societal development sectors, spanning senior leadership and entrepreneurial roles in corporate strategy, digital transformation, management consulting and sustainable development. So we'll pass over Sanjay and um, look forward to hearing your presentation. Much Kate, I hope you can hear me. Great, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. This is the first time I have the privilege of sharing some thoughts with this forum. So. I hope I don't share with you things that you already know, but I'll try uh, to to share some uh, questions more than uh, presentation. So I don't have slides by design. I chose not to do slides today. So let's me just share some perspectives. I think we have well established the question of why do we need to focus on the topic of today and what we are doing. Uh, I'm exploring some paradigms on how do we approach this challenge? And the question that we are trying to answer is, how do we solve this problem together at scale? And that's the question that we are trying to answer, saying, how do we solve this challenge of understanding and learning more about our communities together at scale? I want to today talk about three important paradigms that we are working with. One paradigm is, as we work in India, it's a country of 1.36 billion people. Uh, it's a country where one third of the country does not have digital access. One third of the country has basic digital access and probably one third of the country has a better digital access, if you will. To say, how do we not focus on creating standard ways of measuring things? but move towards setting standards so that people can participate in, in measuring and sharing their state, sharing their, their situations, sharing their cares and concerns in the context of where they are, whether it is rural, tribal, remote communities. To give you an example, one of the important projects we've been working on in the state of Gujarat in India is in the area of education where we wanted to understand the learning levels of children. And that's the question that we started with, and we created a very simple way of standardizing how do you create questions and answers that can be handwritten, created by people in different remote areas, but created a very simple scanning mechanism so that we could scan that data and get to understand what is happening. In a short period of time, we were able to put together 365 million records spanning 4.4 million students to understand what is the level of learning, how they are doing. And this was not through a standard test or a, a standard way of looking at things, but more setting standards around which different participants in the community could think about how to really uh, so to say, share their state of learning, their state of challenges, their state of questions. 
so we've been uh, thinking through a lot of is 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 this about doing standard things or setting standards i think that's the question that we are trying to sort of work with the second question that we are trying to work with is most of the time we design processes by which we extract data and we are saying can we create processes by which we allow the communities to emit their data and we can capture and understand what is happening as they emit more like our bodies emit the temperature and then we design a thermometer to understand what's going on with the body rather than taking a blood sample every time we want to know what's going on in the body and that's why designing systems with very uh, basic telemetry the ability to capture data i'll give you an example again when we were going through the COVID crisis and we tried to understand what is happening to education in remote and tribal areas, we put together a collective of 15 partners in 12 states. Which were hard to reach. And using different modes, whether it was radio, newspapers, other uh, civil society organizations, mobile telephony were available, trying to understand what is happening in these communities because they were emitting their state, where they are, where what they are trying to uh, deal with, what are their struggles. Our intent was not to again go and extract that information, but capture what they were emitting, their state that they were sharing anyways. We saw a 16.6% improvement in student performance in this period because we were able to sense what they were emitting, what they were trying to understand. Now in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest state of India, we are trying to work with 135,000 schools to understand how do we understand what are they already emitting and can we make sense of what are they already emitting so the paradigm we are trying to explore is every time we don't have to extract information sometimes we have to be better at understanding what they're emitting and the last point i wanted to uh, sort of highlight is what is the purpose of understanding all this information and he said that we should focus on how we use information to work in their own and solve their own problems rather than evaluate the success of our initiatives or become better informed about what we should be doing. And with that objective, for example, with one of the uh, programs we work with, which is the Foundation for Ecological Security, which works on helping uh, livelihoods um, uh, with, with, with the commons, um, they have been working on training rural cadres of people who actually look at how do you use local information to solve local problems. Now, that's a very different paradigm. It's not about centralizing the information. It's not about creating a central pool or, or collecting it in one place, but rather collecting it where it is required and using it right there to actually make a difference, right? So how can they use the data rather than give me the data kind of a question? How, do they, how can they help themselves and what are the systems required to be able to deal with this? So I think in summary, these are some of the paradigms that we are trying to explore when we deal with very difficult situations, very difficult and remote and, and, and situations at scale. Uh, thinking about millions of people is, can we move from standardizing to setting standards? Can we move from extracting information to understanding how to, how to uh, connect with what the system is already emitting? Can we move from evaluating using data or understanding, um, improving our understanding vis-a-vis -vis using data to help those remote communities work with their own problems and solve it in their own context? Because if we can improve the system's ability to see, uh, we believe that it will improve the system's ability to solve. A lot of these experience we have curated um, and it's all Creative Commons. Uh, whenever you have some time, uh, do visit where we are curating these learnings. We're still learning and hopefully along with all of you will continue to learn as you move forward. Thank you so much for your attention today and looking forward to the interaction ahead. Excellent, thank you so much Sanjay. That was 
really interesting and lots of your points really resonated I think that big question of what's the point why are we collecting this data and what's it for is such a critical one um, to think about especially as we work with more marginalized population groups so we'll now turn um, to a Q&A with the speakers and I see some questions are starting to come through. So we're gonna use a blend of the questions that were sent in advance and then also make sure we um, come to these ones that are coming through now. Um, I'm gonna ask the speakers to try and keep their responses to around two minutes and then we can get through more questions and hopefully a few of you can come in and kind of build on each other's responses. Um, I think there's been a lot of synergies already in this discussion. So we can start off with, I think, a broad question that's um, been covered a little bit, but I think is an interesting one about how do we even start to define who are constituted by hard to count population groups? There's been some discussion in the chat about is that the right terminology to be using and what does that look like if communities don't recognize themselves in that term? Um, so I wonder if we could just spend a few minutes talking about with each of the different population groups or within each context that you work in, how do you actually define what a hard to count population means? And Sanjay, maybe we can um, start with you and then um, I'll come to Renice and then Claudia. Thank you for that uh, question, Kate. Um, I think the hard to count uh, when we are thinking about is um, who's counting? um and why um and and i think that in many ways because india india is a country of massive diversity and i'm sure many of the other countries on this call are also countries of massive diversity and and to be successful in in dealing with this diversity we have to be able to deal with this diversity rather than make it converge into something that can be that can be counted uh, and so I think it's important for us to define hard to count itself, uh, by whom, uh, under what circumstances, for what purposes. Um, and, and we have been learning that counting or, or understanding to empower the people to solve their own problems in their own diverse contexts is the real question that we are trying to deal with. So whether it's a question of languages, geography, location, remoteness to reach, uh, and people's even reluctance to be, uh, be seen, if you will. And I think the key question is, um, how do we help people converge? Uh, how do we help understand the ecosystem with the minimalistic amount of no information as possible. So we have one of these works that we've been working with saying, what is the least amount of information required uh, to be able to understand uh, our diversity rather than, you know, why, because we are collecting, let's create more and more and more complex, more and more comprehensive data sets. Uh, because uh, it's important for us to understand who are we counting and why are we counting, right? Great, yeah, I think you're speaking to kind of the inherent power dynamics that come with data and with the questions that we ask the people that we serve with those data efforts. Renice, I wondered if you wanted to come in on this question of how you're defining those hard to count population groups in Kenya. Thank you very much. Now in Kenya, we define uh, the hard uh, to count population as persons who are facing various barriers. And uh, due to that, they have some fear, like uh, during uh, the enumeration period, they have some fear that information captured might be leaked out or uh, used against them. So we use such definitions to define them. And uh, such people include persons with disability, among other groups that I shared during my presentation. So they are even hard to contact during enumeration. They are hard to locate. Like uh, in the case of refugee, refugees and uh, asylum seekers, it was reported after census that some of them went 
to the conventional houses or households and they were hiding there and they didn't want to give their identity as refugees. So those are examples of they had to count population in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Anise. You touched on a really interesting point there about the dynamics of trust and how that comes into working with um, hard to reach population groups. Alison, let me pass over to you. Sure. Um, I, I think the, the comments so far have been great. I just wanted to echo something actually that was put in the chat that um, I think Tristan Hurley from the immunization program in the UK mentioned, which was this idea of changing the frame. Um, and I think when we start talking about policy, and conversations in government. I think the idea of changing the frame from hard to count or hard to reach to underserved is actually very important. And it sort of dovetails a little bit with what I was just talking about with um, the Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community in the US. And we've seen issues with that, particularly recently, um, some of the, and this goes back to what Renice was just saying, some concerns during the census about, you know, uh, be, you know, so sort of being vocal and being present. And so I think um, just something for us to think about as a broader frame, but I do think it, it goes from what is it, how is it negative and from a researcher standpoint to how do we actually make this more of a community effort? And this is important to do. And that's what that term sort of underserved brings to the table. Great, thank you. And Claudia, I know UNICEF obviously works in a huge amount of different contexts. And so wondering how you think about that and if there's anything you wanted to add. First, let me say I agree with the points that were made before me. I wanted to add one element of the importance of partnerships again, because we know that maybe from the statistical standpoint, if we were to implement a traditional data collection approach with statistical office or other really uh, handling the project by themselves, I think this can create even more the sense of missing populations. Uh, because uh, I'll, I'll take the example of, of uh, uh, persons with disabilities. As we know, there is a lot of stigma. Families themselves might want to hide, for instance, persons with disability. And if we go and approach to a normal household survey and ask, you know, about the household members living in these families, the family member themselves might not uh, disclose that there is a person with disability. But at the same time, if a statistical office, an interviewer goes there and then is not able to administer the questionnaire because the person is not able to speak some language, for instance, that's another barrier. So it's also sometimes the data collection that create invisibility by not being inclusive. So again, working with organization of persons with disability, with the civil society, with those who know these populations because they try to serve these populations, that's a very important factor. So, and this has to be at the onset of the data collection efforts because the civil society organization are also uh, able to mobilize the necessary inputs in terms of data needs. And therefore, in the process of the data collection, also identif help identify the populations and reach them so that we make sure that our data collection efforts are inclusive. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Claudia. And I actually wanted to pick up on one of the points that um, you raised there about partnerships. And this is a question that came through um, in the registration form was thinking about how do we best kind of triangulate data from multiple methods of measuring or counting when you bring together these partnerships you know when you have different um types of data sources trying to come together or different standards that have been used and so claudia i wonder if you had anything you wanted to add on that point and then maybe sanjay we can come to you as i know you were mentioning about the difference between standardization and standards and how maybe that can increase kind of commonality in language and terminology across um, different actors Thank you, Kate, Thank for you, this Kate. question. For me, the, the importance of combining data sources is twofold. So first of all, of course, there is this validation element of making sure that depending on the data source, but also the respondent to your questionnaire, you have a 360 overview. And I can give a specific example. But the, the thinking about a, a, a series of, of data sources, it's also important because we know and we shouldn't expect one data source to be able to answer all the questions we have about a population. So we cannot expect household surveys to tell us about the what and the how and the why. So we, we should not 
think about one data source being able to address all the data needs. So we really have to think about what is our question or questions and how we use the different data sources to be able to address this constellation of different sources. When it comes to validation, I'll give you an example. Let's think about the education sector. Let's think about the information that we can gather through EMIS. So the education management information system. This is the type of information that is provided by the education sector, by the schools, for instance, can give you the school perspective on buildings, accessibility, et cetera. Now, this is one piece of information, but if you ask the same question to parents of children with disabilities, again, going to school about accessibility issues, you have a very different perspective because, of course, offer and supply is one thing, but there is also the demand elements. So combining these different sources will really help us understand not only what is out there and it's presented as being available, but also the barriers that certain certain families or children, for instance, might encounter in accessing certain services. Learnings we have had is the is the is the understanding of context. So, if you were to look at uh, this challenge with a perspective that there is some information which is context independent. There is some information which is context aware, and there is some in information which is context intensive. Um, and so if you try to sort of unpack or unbundle this problem to, to sort of layer this, then it becomes very different because, you know, you could also architect some kinds of basic fundamental information registries to capture information that is context independent. It is um by the act of being in a country you are able to understand some facets but that is not enough and then the question is what context are you in are you in a remote tribal rural area or are you in an inaccessible area and then within that what is the state of affairs that you're dealing with so we are now getting deeper and deeper into context if we club all of this together it becomes extremely hard so one of the things that we have tried to do is what we call as convergence architectures convergence architecture is information could come from multiple sources there could be some sources which are physical some sources which are digital some sources which could come from communities some could come from uh, civil society organizations some information that could come through government uh, mechanisms or development organizations and so on and so forth but the ability to understand is this information context independent, context aware or context intensive? And how do you then bring this together uh, to make sense? Uh, we always say that you have to sense, make sense, learn and then improve. And so the question is, how do you make sense uh, of putting this together? I believe that putting this together, uh, given where technology is, et cetera, is the easier of the problems. The more difficult of the problems is ensuring that convergent sources uh, are able to come together and we are able to distinguish between what is something that is common to all the people, what is something that is common to some people, and what is something that is very specific for a community or a person, and the ability to deal with this information. So I believe that a lot of this triangulation challenge is the challenge of architecture, it's the challenge of design, it's the challenge of how we think about information, rather than uh, than the the challenge of collecting or or analyzing thank you really fascinating responses and i mean we could go into so much more detail there's so many questions that we're trying to um get through here and i see them coming in more and more in the chat one question um, for Renice that I think is an interesting one and builds on Sanjay's point about context is what are the techniques that KMBS is used in terms of estimating populations or counting populations that are hard to reach um, in disaster context? And this point was specifically brought up around COVID-19 and obviously the restrictions that are brought in around um, being able to do in-person data collection. So Renice, I wondered if you wanted to add anything about um, techniques you use in that specific context of disaster context or rapid responses. Well, 
one of the most common methods that we usually use is uh, what we call uh, modified cluster sampling method. I'm not sure if it's just for me, but I can't hear Anise. In which case, maybe we can turn um, to another question and see if Renise can come back in a moment. Um, and that was a really interesting question that I think we could pass to maybe Alison and Sanjay to start off, which is about what policies could be um, developed to stimulate better counting of populations that are hard to count and what innovative techniques are out there already and have you got um, some experience of those that you would like to share so Alison I'll pass that to you first thank um, so I think from our perspective first it's having policies on data period. Um, I think that's sort of like a, a, a baseline on that. Um, and then being able to focus on underserved populations within that. So I think that's, I mean, for us, that's actually one of the, the important pieces. I also wanted to just highlight um, and sort of plus one, the idea and the issue of, um, or the idea of having ecosystem partnerships. So this not just being about even government or academia, that you really have to be bringing in all, really kind of all the available resources and thinking about how you integrate those data pieces. I think that is such a critical piece of the conversation. And I, unfortunately, I feel like most efforts tend to either set, you know, at the, sit up in more ivory towers than really getting down into the real world. And again, bringing in community organizations. I think we're at a point where, um, you know, it's a little bit all hands on deck. And um, again, sort of reinforcing that this is about bringing voices for everybody to the table. I think the other thing I just wanted to make a quick note on is the importance of, um, and very often what happens is we see organizations for very good reasons because of their policy focus, focusing on a kind of underserved population and not necessarily looking at issues of intersectionality. And I think that that's also a really critical piece of the conversation we need to have and looking at efforts across. I know that that's been something in the work that we've been doing um, with the UN on digital inclusion that's been really important, right? That it's not just about a focus on older persons or younger persons or displaced persons, that it's also looking at the best practices that work across those and using those as leverage points for policy so that you're not just advocating for one group of underserved, that you're really looking at solutions that cross as much as you can. And of course, that's not always going to happen, that cross all of those or, or more underserved populations. share three lenses here uh, one we are working with the lens of ownership which is who owns the data institution individual commons there are so many narratives so we've been working with this premise called DEPA which is data empowerment and protection architecture um, and this fundamentally is a way of looking at how do you create data architectures for democracies right so so how do you really define what does it mean to own data, who owns the data, and what is the protection architecture of that data? It's a very important facet when we go deeper and deeper into our communities. The second lens we are looking at, so this was the ownership lens. Um, the second lens we are looking at is the capacity lens. Do people have the ability to emit their state, to share their state? Do they have the ability to use their data? because you know they may be everybody can come and measure or survey people but that's not the point the point is can people share their state and actually use their own data for their own advantage do they have the capacity to do it 
what are the policies, design principles required so that whether they are state systems or whether they are development sector systems, systems are designed to help people um, share their state and use their data. And the third is uh, what we call as the question of agency, which means that do people have an understanding of what is it that they have and what can they do with it? So we've been looking at policies, processes, design principles that are focused on ownership, capacity, and agency when it comes to dealing with data for the most vulnerable and the underserved people in our communities, because most of the time we try to take a top-down view of this problem. Is there something that we could learn if we took a bottom-up view of the problem and saying, what is my understanding of the ownership? What is my capacity to do something about it? And do I have the agency to actually act on, on, on my state, right? So using that as a, as a policy frame uh, has been uh, leading us to some interesting uh, places. Really fascinating points. Thank you so much. And I think, Sandhu, what you're just saying also brings to mind that whole movement of kind of indigenous data sovereignty and thinking about what does it mean for people to have the rights to their own data and for them to be very much consciously involved in that process. Um, and Alison, I think you also raised the point about intersectionality in data, and that's I think something that we see a lot of our work and a lot of inclusive data champions are really moving towards not just thinking about one disaggregation dimension or one population group, but thinking much more holistically about what inclusive data systems look like. Um, and we're actually launching some new products on that today. So I'll send the link in case anyone would like to um, check out what um, lots of partners are doing on intersectionality and data. So I think we have maybe time just for one last question. And um, a question came in in the chat for uh, Alison. So I'll pass that over to you. And the question's, um, do you have additional insights to share from a gender perspective or gender analysis of older persons? So again, a little bit about that intersectionality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say that the, the main space that at least that's coming to mind right now for gender being a dynamic is um, when you start dealing with issues of longevity um, and the fact that we do have a changing face of the population um, as we get older and older. And so you're going to have an even stronger disconnect with older women in being able to sort of be counted, right? So I think that's probably one of the critical, uh, most critical things that we're seeing. And with that, and this goes back to some of the issues that I mentioned as well, um, you're also going to see things like them being less likely, or, or sorry, more likely to be affected by um, dementia or cognitive issues. And some of that is, um, you know, we're, we're, there's there's a lot of research. We have a global council on brain health that's looking a lot into that. But um, so we're trying to understand more about that dynamic with gender. But a lot of it does seem to dovetail in with longevity. Great, that sounds fascinating. And Alison, just sorry to come back on another point. I saw a message in here also about, I guess, how disability intersects. And I know that there was some work that you've been doing on that angle too. So I wonder if you had anything to add there. And then Sanjay, we'll come back to you um, if you have any comments on more of that intersectional approach. Yeah, thanks, Kate. I, I think when we talk about, I think one of the things about disability, um, and this actually goes, I think, to your point about being more holistic and inclusive in the way that we look at things is one, I don't think that people actually recognize the role that disability tends to play across the lifespan and actually how pervasive it is. We don't think about those things. And so um, one of the things that we've been doing in our digital inclusion work, which would then overlap as we start talking about some of the issues in data collection are about mapping sort of the different kinds of disability or accessibility issues, as you'd say, that we see across the lifespan. Um, and, you know, if you think about these things from an inclusive design perspective, we know that when you make things easier for people with accessibility or disability issues, it makes it better for everybody. I think we've seen that, for example, um, most recently in, in groups that were developing you know, as an example, closed captioning for video. Um, and then suddenly everybody wanted closed captioning for video, right? It actually made it better for everybody in their meetings. And so I think that's important. We actually look at that when we, um, and there are accessibility standards for surveys, for example, um, for online. And so I think looking at that is a really, um, is a really critical issue. 
Um, and again, not just for older persons, but really for everybody. Brilliant, thank you. I agree with, I think, everything you just said. <laughs> Sanjay, I don't know if you want to have any last comments. Um, I'll pass it back over to you. Um, thank you so much for that, Kate. But I think uh, based on the conversation today, the thought that comes to my mind is that as civilization has moved from the age when we became better by moving matter, moving things, then we became better by moving energy. And now we are in this generation where we are getting better by moving information. I think it, it behooves us to think about what does it mean to use that paradigm to bring the equity, bring the inclusion that that we have to really get it right. So I think the question is, everybody talks about data is the new oil, data is the new resource, et cetera. But the real question is, how are we using this in the service of the most vulnerable, the remote, the unreachable people? And more importantly, how are we helping them use their own capabilities and their own situation and their own data to make their own lives better rather than giving data to others so that they can figure out what to do with them? I always see that it's always better to create an environment where I can see and I can solve rather than you can see and you can solve my problems. Brilliant, thank you. And that's a, a really profound and important point to end on, to be honest. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to our presenters. I think Claudia and Renice had to drop off a little early. Um, and Sanjay and Alison, it's been absolutely fascinating having you all join us. Thank you so much to all the participants. I hope that this has been both informative and interesting. And I think there's many ways that you can take forward this information. Um, and hopefully the conversation can continue on. Please um, feel free to, you know, follow the um, Data World Forum on Twitter. It's at UN Data Forum, and um, you can see all the updates and events that are coming up through the website and Twitter. So we're um, very excited to continue these conversations and hopefully um, connect with many of you at um, the World Data Forum in October. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to organizers for making this happen and um, hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you.